Thank you very much. And we'd like to welcome uh, to the stage the co-directors and the co-writers of Shaun the Sheep, the movie, Mark Burton and Richard Starzak. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Mark Burton. Welcome. And Richard Starzak. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Richard's also known as Golly, which is his nickname, which I just, there's no confusion when the two of you are talking amongst yeah. each other. There isn't a third, per third imaginary person on the stage, or in the briefcase either. Uh, Richard has brought along two puppets from the film, which hopefully we'll bring out during the conversation. And also, um, they're very happy for people to have their pictures taken with the... Uh, with the puppets afterwards as well, if you'd like to. If you'd like Five to pound a pop. Yeah. No, it's all right. <laughs> we'll be checking your pockets on the way out, though. Uh, thank you. Thanks, both of you, for being here. We're going to see a couple of clips uh, from Sean the Sheet, the movie, during the discussion. Um, and we're also going to take questions from you at the end. So please do think of anything you'd like to ask uh, our guests. Uh, I'd like to hear... We're here to talk about the making of the film, the story behind the film, and hopefully give people a taste of what they what they will get when they uh, when they or if they go to see it. Can, can we just go back and talk about the the character Sean the Sheep? I mean, he began. It's always been part. He's been part of the Ardman world for quite a long time. I think he, he emerged in one of the Wallace and Gromit shorts. Yes, he was. Um, he was originally in uh, a Close Shave, and he was a sort of ex he was uh, wasn't one of the main characters, but he was uh, on screen for about six minutes, but. Um, was very popular as a result. We knew that uh, uh, he had fans out there, and uh, so it, typical Ardman fashion, it only took us about another 12 years to uh, to ca capitalise on that and make a series. How, how, how do you know that? How do you gauge the fact that he has fans? How do you know there's people out there that well, potentially we, would be interested in TV series and that and now the movie? Well, it was uh, uh, we had we had some Shaun the Sheep backpacks made, and um, one of the uh, Spice Girls, Emma Bunton wore it and she got photographed and I think it was in Vogue magazine and um, and then they all suddenly sold out and so uh, it was it, we well, just basically get a Spice Girls spot to, yeah. to tell they'll tell you if you're fashionable or not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I mentioned obviously Shaun the Sheep is an, uh, very much an Ardman character it's an Ardman film um, it's uh, there aren't that many production houses in animation or elsewhere where you know the name of the production house really means something you immediately get a sense of what the values are what the approach is to storytelling and filmmaking. Before we talk about Sean the Sheep, I'd just like to hear from you. What would you say are the values of Ardman? What, what, do, you, what do you say it is that you know, the principles that that come with an Ardman story, with an Ardman film, whether that's short film, TV, movie making? Well, it, it's very hard to say from the inside, but uh, I think uh, myself and the fa founders of the company and Nick Park and also Mark more uh, latterly is that we, we all have the same influences, whether it's... Um, Early comics like Wizard and Chips and Abino, and uh, and uh, we all like the same kind of animation. We're all fans of um, we're all, all fans of Warner Brothers cartoons, and uh, so there, there were there were similar influences all around. So I think that's where the kind of look and feel comes from. I think also um, yeah, like the Morgan and Wise growing up watching those kind of shows. There's this word Britishness. What does it mean? I don't know, but that's a, often used as an idea of Armin being very British. Um, and I think there's I suppose. We, we, we have talked about it in the company sometimes, you know, what is this thing? And it's kind of, um, you know, can we pin it down? And uh, Steve Box once said, who's a, who's a co-director of Wallace and Gromit, it was um, that, we, that Arben often takes big epic stories, you know, and does kind of cheeky versions of them. And it's almost like there's a kind of sense of we take the work very seriously that we do, but we don't necessarily take you know, ourselves very seriously and we don't take the world very seriously. So there's a sort of, there's a, there's a kind of, kind of, I suppose that very British thing of, you know, um, a bit of a modesty about, about uh, what we're doing, you know, and the stories we tell. And uh, we've got, we've got also got a history of not, we, we, funnily enough, Shaun the Sheep was Arben's first children's series uh, eight years ago um, in the long history. So uh, we've never, we've never made films specifically for children. We kind of, uh, make ourselves laugh f first and foremost, and um, and it seems to pull everyone along with it. And, and the other thing for me that defines well it defines Shaun the Sheep the movie, but defines Arben more generally is obviously the approach to animation, stop motion animation based around 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 clay models. I mean, if you could just pick up from there and just explain to me, presumably, you know, over the years that Arben has evolved, techno the technology out there to create animation has evolved hugely, but we. And I'm sure it's about the way you make films has evolved hugely as well. But there's there seems to be this desire to keep what's seen on screen. You know, there's a constant in the sense of style. 
Well, yes, I mean, we, we're big advocates of stop frame and um, again, that's part of the heritage is we, we grew up with Trumpton and all these Bagpuss and uh, the Clangers and all these stop frame shows. And uh, so we loved those and that, that we've, we've carried it on. You know, it's often said that uh, stop frame is a dying art, but we're, we're making more stop frame than ever us and um, uh, Leica in Portland, Oregon. So it's, it's still a very popular medium. I mean, I think I think uh, Arben itself has 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 been, you know, um, has progressed the technology in some way. Certainly, the the puppets themselves, which we'll look at later in terms of how they're made and the armatures they have and so on. But I think there's a it it comes back to um, the kind of skill of the animators in in how you um, bring those figures to life and the kinds of the detail and the expression and the flourishes that they bring. Um, and, and there is, you know, when you go to Arben Studios. Um, it's a sort of not particularly impressive building on the outskirts of Bristol, like a big old warehouse. Um, you look at the pictures on the walls and you see people you know, like Golly and other animators wearing tank tops with long hair or looking very young. And you get this, you realise there's this amazing heritage that's built up over many, many years. And it's the same people there and they've got even more experience and you know, they've sort of worked on their talent. So you've got this fantastic pool of craft, really. So I think that in itself has kind of progressed it. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about both your backgrounds, actually, that you brought to this film. Richard, you, you've, you've got a longer history with, with Ardman. I mean, if you could, when, did, when did you start? When did your relationship with them start? Oh, a very long time ago. Probably about, I was uh, employee number one in the early 80s. And uh, um, I, at, the, at the time, the company just consisted of Pete Lord and Dave Sproxton, and they were making Morph for a program called Heartbeat with Tony Hart. And um, I got some work on there, and um, I just thought it would last a few weeks. You know, it's, it's just something fun to do until I got a proper job. And, uh, but the company t took off uh, shortly after that, so, uh, yeah. Uh, Mark, your background is as a writer, and this is your, this is your first film as, as a director as well. Uh, that's, that's true, yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't tell them that, but... Um, <laughs> um, admit it now. <laughs> no, no, no. No, um, actually, I mean, I, I have a long relationship with Ardman, uh, but my background is actually um, sort of more TV comedy, uh, yeah. working on Spitting Image and um, How I Got News For You and some of those shows. Yeah. Although I was discussing this earlier with Golly, actually, I, I realised sort of when I was a kid, I used to um, make kids' comics. I was very into like kids' comics, Wizard and Chips and so on. Yeah. Less Marvel, more those kind of Beano and that kind of thing. Yeah, the very uh, British ones. Yeah, one of my yeah. first write, professional writing jobs was writing storylines for Wizard and Chips mm -hmm. for IPC and stuff. So in a, in a weird kind of way, I've kind of, I guess I've gone full circle back, back to kind of, you know, drawn animation uh, and drawings. But um, I, I, uh, I was first joined Arben for Chicken Run, which um, yeah. was written by uh, an American called Kerry Kirkpatrick. But me and my then partner, John O'Farrell, were asked to come in and kind of... Mm what we call a punch up which is where you add jokes in and sort of you know do some work yeah. on it uh, and, and from then on really I kind of I've worked with Armin on and off for, ever since then um, obviously worked on the um, the wear rabbit and um, so I sort of feel part of the family but I'm a, like a more like a sort of cousin that comes and goes rather than being you know like golly who's there all the time before we're going to see a couple of clips before we see the first clip I'd just like to talk about you know, the, the beginnings of devising a story for film for this film. Now, obviously, there's a big difference between the series of short films that Sean the Sheet was beforehand and finding a story that you know, can hold, hold the audience over you know, almost 90 minutes as well. What were the beginnings of your thinking about, okay, well, when you were thinking, right, we want to bring Sean the Sheep to, the, to, to, the, to film, what, what were the challenges you were thinking of? And what were those first steps in terms of coming up with the story that would work for, for, that, that, would work for that character as well? Because obviously you want to preserve something. I think there's, there's two things that we knew immediately. Uh, one was that... Uh, we'd have to take those characters out of their comfort zone and put them into a new, a new world. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think the second thing was they had to have an emotional life. Not that they don't have that in a TV series. I think one of the successes of the show you know, that Golly has created is that, the, that there is a kind of sense, sometimes it's quite poignant. But we really wanted to sort of dig in a bit deeper and, and actually give them an emotional story um, that would that would sustain. So that was those were the t two primary things I think. Yeah, take them out of their comfort zone, and we yeah, looking for what what's the opposite of a farm, and it's it's the city. So that felt very uh, a nice fit. Take them out and put them somewhere where their lives could be very difficult. Yeah. So actually, I mean, there is this really natural opposite, as you're suggesting there as well. You know, if, it, if someone's brought up on a farm, then put them put them in the city, which is an, it, an archetype in some ways of storytelling. It is it? really, yeah. and I think we were, and that was fine for us. I think we wanted to we wanted quite a simple story. Mm. And a simple setting, and we wanted to just enjoy 
those characters in that setting really and just explore that in, you know well let's see i mean and presumably the other one of the other things you might be looking for when you're devising a movie story is you know an enemy uh you know a, a, some, some, someone who's the opposite or you know the, who brings a threat and the clip we're going to see is trumper who's yes. you know on you know essentially trying to capture these animals after they've let themselves loose can i just say one thing yeah. about that actually before we watch the clip because one of the films we watched a lot of films silent movies and so on yeah. and um you know jack tatty and other things but we also were quite influenced by a film called ferris bueller's day off i don't know if you, uh, yeah, yeah. you know that film um we've got a whoop yeah we love that <laughs> film we love it too but um uh and one of the things they had there was that they there's a kind of story which is ferris bueller having his day off and kind of changing the world around him but so the villain story in that is kind of a, which is a head teacher it's very comic and kind of a secondary story so for yeah. us, we were influenced by that in that we wanted a character, we wanted a villain in there, we wanted to you know, have that sort of jeopardy and the fun of that, but it's not the main part of the story, it's kind of yeah. like a, yeah. an additional problem. So that's the thinking behind Trumper, yeah. our villain. And you mentioned Jack Tatty there as well, were you thinking of Playtime? Because obviously that's a very traditional French character, suddenly finds himself in this very modern city. Trying you did to watch Playtime actually, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we were, we definitely were influenced by yeah. the way that Jacques Tati uses sound as a mm. kind of device. And, and, and visual puns. Yeah. Is yeah. That, that's exactly. Cleverest. Well, we'll talk about both those things, sound especially, and, and visual puns. But let, let's see the clip. This is hiding from Trumper. This is Trumper trying to capture the sheep and get them off to the pound. Excellent. And one thing we should just start talking about, I mean, it is, once you've seen the film, it's almost stating the obvious. It's not a silent film, but it's a dialogue-free Film. Yes, we call, we, we call it a, a, a slapstick comedy without words. Yes, yeah, yeah. But it's, I mean, it, it, is, it is full of noises as well. But this is obviously, did you, did you discuss this among yourselves at the very beginning? Are we going to bring dialogue into this or are we going to preserve the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the same soundscape that was in there's the short film? There's definitely a fear factor in not having any dialogue. I think we scared ourselves a bit and then we scared everyone around us. Like, can this, can this actually work, like a dialogue-free film? We were very encouraged... Um, by the artist, when the artist came out, we were, we kind of um, stole our thunder a bit because we thought we, we're doing a modern silent movie and, and then the artist came out. So they beat us to it a little bit. But it, uh, when we started to put the reels together, it became apparent we didn't need dialogue. So we're happy with that. I think also, um, you know, uh, to answer the question, we, we, right from the word go, it had to be a silent movie. And I think, you know, Golly was particularly, uh, strong on that and that was the big idea of the film which is like okay we're going to take the seven minute sean series which doesn't have a dialogue in it and if we're going to do that we have to stick to the integrity of the series so it has to be told that way i think we were also a little bit influenced by sort of horror story which was the tom and jerry movie of the 80s where they kind of took the lovely tom and jerry that we loved and kind of gave them voices and the whole thing was horrible. So I think there's a little bit of that, which is rather, we'd rather go the plough this furrow. We know it's going to be a, a challenge and it's, there's risk, but rather than go the other way, which is kind of a, you know, the wimp's way, really. And, and this obviously means that, I mean, the visual humour is always very important, but this must mean that the visual humour is even more important. And the situations within which you put Sean and the rest of the flock, I mean, you, it, it is great situation and comedy. I mean, you've got the hairdressers, you've got the restaurant, you've got the, the, the second clip we're going to see is called In Prison. That's when they're, when he ends up in the pound as well. So that, those situations must have to work even harder. Yeah, well, they're all, they're all part of the story. They're, they're all, they all uh, drive the story on. You know, the restaurant scene we, uh, we loved because the idea of sheep dressed as humans and trying to pick up the, um, uh, pick up the etiquette you, you need to, to survive in a restaurant without being found out was, was very funny. Uh, and then there's a hospital scene, I think, which is probably one of my favourites, which is... Um, uh, Bits of the dog uh, has to disguise himself in um, in a surgeon's clothing so he can get into the hospital because he's a dog and he won't be let in and um, uh, he ends up in a uh, nearly making an operation uh, on somebody. So yeah, that, yeah. That, that that scene and the restaurant scene I think are particularly great. Yeah, I mean I think we uh, uh, and I think the other the other thing actually we found first of all is God he says that you know we were sort of like, oh we're going to do a film without any dialogue is taking a big step here but then we kind of found it was uh, almost um, a positive thing for us because it meant we had to tell the story a certain way and there's always this thing we used to say that you know you can you can watch a good film with the sound turned down and and we kind of we, we had to sort of try and find a story that was simple enough to be told visually but you know had enough in it emotionally and, and otherwise that was going to be interesting and people weren't going to get bored so it, it kind of disciplined us actually so it was actually quite a good thing to do in the end it was quite a sort of discipline 
But we should talk a bit about what it actually means in practical terms to make a feature length stop frame animated movie. You I know you were saying to me beforehand this took this took three years and and in, in the world of stop frame animated movies and certainly the the films that you've worked on before, this this was quick. Yeah, it was like an adrenaline rush for us because uh, uh, normally uh, films of that that size usually take about five years. Um, so it was it was very fast. The production was particularly fast in sort of nine months, um, and we were producing. It doesn't sound like much, but we were producing uh, two minutes of, of footage a week, and uh, so we could watch the rushes at the end of the week. Um, it doesn't seem like much, but to us it was like. I can't believe we're doing this so quickly. It's amazing. Can you talk us through a little bit of... Um, I'm sure it's probably quite hard to condense, to be brief about it, but to, to what the, the process that goes on before you actually start shooting, before you start actually shooting those frames. I mean, I think I mean, one, of the, one of the incredible figures about the production I had here was that you, you, you've, 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 there are 80,000 storyboards existing before, I didn't know you, that. before you start That's to great. animate. That's right. Yeah, Who well. counted them? <laughs> I don't know, but, did uh, you see them? Yeah, well, we, we, we probably did. I mean, yeah. The answer is that you know the you, where you find the film is on the storyboard. The storyboard process is one where um, you know there's a 2D uh, sort of drawings by a, a very talented group of story artists, which which you can then make move now. You know, you can put them in edit, and we we put scratch sound on it and so on. And you you, you don't get the total sense, but you get a, a very strong sense of how the film is playing. And so yeah, we wrote a script. And we, you know, we discuss stuff, but that was really where the hard work goes on. And that's, that's where we test the ideas to destruction because what, what what might seem a really good idea on paper is then you you, you board it and, and play it out, and it's it's not not firing on all cylinders, and uh, maybe it's completely wrong, or maybe it needs adjusting. But that's where the the hard work starts. Yes. So with moving storyboards these days, this means you're actually you're actually able to see uh, a very rough sketch of of the film, of the segments of the yeah, film, absolutely. and yeah. set and work out where where the beats are, where the humour is or isn't, where the story isn't working. And obviously, yeah. this is all the work you have to do before you before the puppets totally. Go in front but, of the and also, you have to be a little bit careful with stop. Because stop frame has this, unlike CGI, has this um, big leap when you actually do the stop frame itself. You know, as directors, you physically go down to the floor. There's real sets, real puppets, and the animators are like actors that you're working with. So there is that big leap. So you don't know everything. So sometimes um, things that work, um, you know, on the 2D reel or don't work so well will work very well in stop frame uh, and vice versa. But you get a kind of, uh, you get a general sense of how it's playing and how it's working and how the comedy's working as well. So it does help a lot. There's still that leap into the abyss you have to take when you actually animate. It's very difficult. We, we, there is a sort of uh, what we call the constant uh, revolution process where you're constantly changing the reel and adjusting it. But there comes a time where you have to sign off e each scene. And they, they might not be in order, so they go on the studio floor. And I think that for me and Mark, that was very difficult to say, yes, we can start making that now. Uh, that was very tricky because we were, you know, you, you could tinker with it for forever, really. I, I want to hear more in a second about the, you know, the production process, the shooting process, and what it's actually like to be on the set of an Arben film and the set of this Arben film. Before we do that, let's see the second clip, which is uh, it's titled "In Prison," and this is when. Uh, well, let's let's see. I think the uh, the title explains itself. Quick question, just about about that particular clip there. I mean, you, you said before how you watched, you know, you watched various films at the beginning to get to think about the tone and the approach of the film. Presumably, uh, there, there are specific moments during the film where you are nodding towards other films or other films. I don't know what you mean, John. I don't know what you mean. I mean <laughs> that's rubbish. <laughs> uh, no. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously in that one, we've got a little silence of the lambs thing going on there. Yeah. Um, and actually, the whole thing really was kind of, you know. Um, what we call the comic drop of the scene, if you like, which is mm. you know, what's the big idea? Is it's kind of like San Quentin for animals, and that's the fun we have with it. Yeah. Um, and so there is a sort of Shawshank and so on, but often those things aren't specific. They're sort of more general, almost like a so genre joke. Really. Oh, yeah, it's more like the prison movie correct. scene. Yeah, than, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that always comes up in conversation. We go, and I'm sure all filmmakers are the same when they're writing. They go, you know, like such and such, like Breaking Bad, like this, or you, you refer to things. And uh, that kind of works its way into the storyboard, so we have uh, references there. Yeah. yeah. I think also it goes back to that, you know, you were asking earlier, what's the Arben thing? And, and maybe there, a bit of DNA of Arben there, because you've got the, the prison 
genre, as you say, which is a very, you know, quite an intense and very dramatic. Adult, that's the cheek, adult as well. And adult, and that's yeah. the cheeky version of it, basically. Yes. That's yeah, the kind yeah, of yeah. undercut Arvin version of that. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it, but it doesn't interfere with the story and... Uh, Children watching, well, you know, that will just, m m it might go over their heads, but it doesn't matter because it's, uh, it's just a passing gag, really. And do, do you have that conversation about, in terms of who the film is for, who the story is appealing to, or who's understanding it, is that a conversation you're having throughout? You know, what, what, what will adults think about this scene, or how will this play with children? Or is that more of a kind of general, innate tone, you know, or just a, a, you know, a kind of belief in, in what you're doing, rather than having to think about that explicitly. I, I, I think so. Yeah, we. Uh, I think if you go back through Arben's history, we've we've uh, haven't really made children's TV. We always make shows to make ourselves laugh. And uh, if um, you know, so the, it's never that we do adult jokes or children's jokes. We just we just try to do comedy. And occasionally, if there's an adult joke that that the kids might go I don't go know what's going on there we, we, we would drop it but we uh, just uh, actually Omid Jalili described I really like the uh, description of uh, our voiceover for Trummer described um, Sean as an adult film the one that you can take your kids to so that was good I, mean, I think what, what we do try and be by the way is we, we are you know um, very rigorous so that we're, we're We'll ask ourselves the whole time, not so much, is this right for adults or kids or whatever, but is this story working as well as it can be? Is it as funny as it can be? Which is quite a grueling process, actually, because, um, you know, there's a whole time when you want to rest on your laurels, but you always have to be challenging yourself and going, can we do that better, basically? I said we're going to move on and talk about the actual shooting process. What what does the uh, the studio at Arman look like when you're in the middle of? I think it's a ten. I think it was a ten month process. Like the the production, the shooting of this film. What 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 does it look like? I mean, what, what's actually going on? Well, when it's empty, it's just a giant tin box that you could uh, drive cars around, and it's huge. And um, that'd be a good idea, actually. That'd be quite fun to yeah. do that. <laughs> but um, uh, once the production starts, it's divided into um, it's divided into sets. The the sets are built and, and placed in the studio and, and, and curtained off. And uh, I think we get 16 units covering several thousand square feet. And um, yeah, each one, each unit has got uh, a camera and a set and an animator involved. It's quite low tech in a, in a funny sort of way. If you go round it, you know, it's not kind of very uh, high tech, but it's kind of, you know, wobbly, you know, walls between us, curtains and, and lots of boards with marker pens on them making notes. Um, lots of people wandering around holding puppets and, you know, you know, they'll have a hat or something or a kind of, you know, uh, a scythe or whatever it is. Um, very busy, a very busy place. Everybody's very focused and working very hard. And as directors, how, how do you, how, I guess there's the classic image of a director which actually comes from live action filmmaking, not from animated filmmaking. But, so maybe it's, you know, it's wrong to bring those ideas to animation, but how, how do you keep on top of it? Well, we, we, there's a huge support, production support team. So we have um, uh, uh, assistant directors, ADs, and second ADs, and even third ADs who um, make sure that we're in the right place at the right time with the right puppets and the right animator and the right lighting and everything. You know, they, they kind of, uh, we're almost infantilized. We're kind of, uh, you know, almost led round by the hand saying, you've got to deal with this now, you've got to deal with that now. Uh, on a schedule we, we, which we've all agreed on, and um, if you go to the toilet, they kind of stand outside with a walkie-talkie. You know, yeah, it's, it's it's almost finished. She's coming out any minute now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the time is so precious. Yeah. It's like being a cabinet minister, you know. So all your time is is kind of you know uh, worked out for you. Uh, and I think the other thing is that you have to hold the story in your head because we're basically taken out of order to all these different units, and in each unit will be a shot of the film um, done out of sequence by an animator, so you have to arrive into that um, set and you have to be able to brief the animator and know what's being done and look at the, the design and everything, all those kind of questions, or a camera yeah, move maybe. Actually, yeah, when we started shooting, we were shooting shots at the end of the film. We thought, I hope that's going to be okay and we're not going to change our minds. You know, we didn't even a... know the end of the film, to be honest, we just started shooting it, but... There is a lot of that, and um, and so I think that was something that uh, and you know we had a, a chance in the morning, we, we, you know it was quite routinized. We'd we'd, we'd have a, a quite an early start, and me and Golly would have a chance to talk about the shots that were coming up that day, and then we were off doing it, making decisions all the time. You're making decisions on the hoof. That's the hardest thing because when you're a creative person, what you want to do is run away. And so I need to think a bit longer about this, and you can't. It's, there's there's a there, there's this juggernaut that needs to be that needs to keep moving. Um, which is, in a way, is better because it makes you make decisions the whole time. You just hope they're the right ones. It, it seems like a good time to introduce the puppets, I think, uh, Richard, that you've got 
down there. Well, I think everyone will know this one. This is Sean here. Uh, it's quite small scale puppets, really. Uh, they're actually small scale because when we started um, making Sean, uh, we thought to save money if we made uh, the farmer the same size as um, as Wallace, we could we could nick all the sets, and we did. So we we could use a lot of uh, Wallace and Gromit houses. This is Trumper, um, who is made out of several different materials. He's got hard hair. He's got plasticine mouth. The armature runs all the way through to the fingertips. It's wire in the in the hands and um, ball and sockets. Oh, sorry, ball and sockets um, throughout the body. And um, you know, throughout the process, sometimes the finger will break, like like this one has. You see that? And then you can take the hand off and replace it. So it's quite handy having clothed puppets because you can actually uh, take take them apart. See, whoops. Um, and there you are, so it's silicon rubber, um, resin, plasticine, beads for eyes, so lots of different materials. So in terms of, um, in, in terms of cost, it's, it, it's, the materials are actually very cheap, but the hundreds of man hours that goes into making one makes them incredibly expensive. So uh, there you are. Thank you. Um, we've got about uh, 10 minutes to go. We can, we'd like to take some questions from the audience, please. Uh, there is a microphone going around, so if you do have a question, please uh, put your hand up, and there's a microphone in the back. So there's one there, then we'll come down here. And I don't know if there's anyone over here. No, we'll do those two first. Thanks. Right. Um, you've been talking very wittily about the f film influences you have in your shows. Um, I was wondering about the political influences uh, with... Um, I know what's coming. <laughs> with uh, the... Um, uh, associations with Ed Miliband that was happened with Wallace and Gromit and the uh, person who appears to look like Ed Miliband who's a waiter uh, in, appearing in your trailer and uh, I wonder if, if you could confirm that influence was there and if perhaps Sean the Sheep uh, has a message for Ed Miliband. Oh, uh, uh, honest, this is absolutely my honest truth is uh, when we made the, uh, w the waiters at Maitre d' in a restaurant um, I based him on a Maitre d' I knew who, who was kind of... Uh, unspecified European origin. Sometimes his accent was French, sometimes Spanish. And we never knew where he came from. He never, he'd never tell us. I think he was from uh, Walthamstow or somewhere. But the, the thing is that, the, the interesting thing is that actually my, my answer to that question was that if you make a plasticine puppet with bulgy eyes and a slightly squished nose, it's going to look like Ed Miliband. You can't really, <laughs> can't really help that. So, uh, so no answer to Ed Miliband, I'm afraid. Ed Miliband might end up being a waiter. It depends how the election goes. But, uh, <laughs> thank you. There was, there was a question down here, please. Yeah, and then, then I'll come to the back. Thanks. Hi. Um, I saw the film last Sunday. Congratulations. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so many companies are going so much more towards CGI, despite the fact that it is so expensive. Why do you think that is? And what do you think the future of stop motion animation is? Um, I, think, I think if you were to... Uh, start a stop frame company now to make feature films it take a massive massive investment we've got a massive building that we've built up over the years that is you know just in the model making department it's all the uh, it's all the health and safety there's there's air extraction there's heating there's ovens there's paint booths there's, there's every imaginable kind of chemical process going on a bit like breaking bad really so I can, um, with less money I, so we've we're there we've got all we've got that set up and uh, i think to start now would be very difficult that's probably why um cgi is more popular because it involves um you know a lot of um, imax and sound <laughs> desks which is which is lovely we love cgi films as well but um you know stop frame is our tradition and, and we've 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 built our reputation on stop frame and um you know it's been mentioned as a dying art several times but it, it keeps going, and I think there's more stop frame being made now than there ever was. Yeah, can I just add to that, actually, which is interesting. At the moment, um, you know, stop frame films coming out of Leica, who make it in Portland, and there's Tim Burton and Ardman. M maybe there's more of a crisis with, like, you know, DreamWorks have struggled with their films at the moment. Now, well, why that is is another big conversation, whether it's to do with the storytelling or whatever it is. But for some reason, 
there, there is a lot of CGI around and some of those aren't performing that well. So I think actually stop frame is much more resilient than it might seem at first. Yeah, Nick, Nick, this is a little philosophical point that Nick Park made, which is um, which whatever, whatever, whatever you do in, uh, in art, whether you, you're a sculptor, a painter, printmaker, animator, whatever you do, you're, you're working with materials and those materials have limitations and you're pushing against them. And, uh, and it kind of shows, and that's what gives art its charm, is, is it reveals the process, whereas CGI you can do anything with. You can make a character do anything, you can build anything, and it, it kind of shows sometimes, not in all films, I mean, there have been some fantastic films from Pixar and Disney lately, but in some CGI films you just, you just don't believe that things exist. And I think people really like to see uh, animation. When you go to see an animated film, you know it's animated. You don't. You suspend your disbelief. You know it's not real, but and but you can see a puppet stood there, and you can see the sets built, and it it has a charm to it that people love. I mean, people love. You know, we exhibit the sets all over the globe, and and uh, people love to come and see them. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, there's a question at the back, please. Can we please get them the uh, microphone to you? You got it, thank you. Um, I'm a huge fan of you guys, and my question was, how do you do the expressions on their faces? <laughs> and is it, is it many puppets, or is it? do you just change the eyes, and how? We've, we've got... I can't actually do it with this puppet, I'm afraid, because it's, it's kind of glued on, but um, around... Sorry, can you hold the yes. mic up again? Uh, around the mouth there... Uh, you can take the whole mouth off and replace the mouth. So we've got several mouths for each character, not just for vocalizations, but just expression, whether it's smiling or looking s glum or shocked or, or whatever. And you've got eyebrows and movable eyes, and we get all the expression from those, those three. Okay. Thank you. Is there another question I can take? We've got time for maybe one last one. If there's one out there, down here, please. Yeah. Excellent. Hi again, um, this is a personal one. Is there any chance that we might do a Timmy Time film? Because um, I think adults would love that because he is one of my favourites, he is lovely. <laughs> well, we never say never. You know, Timmy's a very popular character and uh, he features quite a lot in the film, so spin-off of a spin-off of a spin-off, who knows? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> Excellent, I think, was there one final question down there? Go on, you can say, go, go on. on yeah. How old is Sean? How old is Sean? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a good question. Good question. How old is Sean? But you know, we talk about this because um, we we think he's like uh, uh, an eleven-year-old boy. You know, he's got the spirit of an eleven-year-old boy, um, which you'll know about one day. And yet, when you get to that age, you um, you you know, I remember being an eleven-year-old boy. You, know, you you push at the boundaries. That's an age when you want to explore the world. And you think you know a lot of things, and you don't want parents to tell you what to do. Yeah, I've seen that in you already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And. Uh, and you're going to do fine. And, there, and there's like a, a, there's a real mischief to you. And I think, but there's also a spirit, you know. Um, it's a, and so Sean is, is that character. And if he sees a button that says don't press, he's going to press it. And he's going to, you know, and, he, and he's, very, he's very street smart. He gets one up on humans, which I think, in a way, is like getting one up on adults for children. But, um, but like Peter Pan, he's going to stay at that age. He will stay that age. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Um, I can bring things to a close, but thank you, uh, Mark Burton and Richard Strazak, for being here today. Thank you for making Sean the Sheet the movie. Uh, the film opens in UK cinemas this Friday, February the 6th. Um, and thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for coming.